Hello, and welcome to this Beyond Clean virtual conference. The speakers for today's conference, the sponsors for today's conference, and the Beyond Clean team are all so excited that you're here. If this is your first time joining us for a Beyond Clean virtual event, I want to call your attention to a couple of event functions. All of the windows on your event screen are movable. You can shrink them, you can enlarge them, you can move them, whatever you need to do to create the event feel that works best for you. In the upper right corner is a resources tool. Download conference sponsor information and the resources and links that your speakers have provided for you. On the bottom left, you will see a Q&A or question and answer tool. Any questions that you have for the speaker during each session can be submitted to them using this feature. Our speakers today will bring you a wealth of knowledge and all of their information can be found in the speaker bio tool on the right side of your screen. Along the bottom are the icons for each of the windows as well. Clicking these will minimize and maximize each window. This will be an action-packed conference and there will be 15 minute breaks between each of the sessions. So feel free to grab a snack, check on the dogs or the kids, assemble a tray, do some jumping jacks, whatever you need to do before joining us again. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adam Okada from Beyond Clean. And on behalf of everyone on the Beyond Clean team, I would like to welcome you to the first ever two-part summer, summer global conference series with the Certification Board for Sterile Processing and Distribution, or CBSPD, an organization dedicated to encouraging continued education for sterile processing and flexible endoscope reprocessing professionals. Joining me this morning is my colleague, Brett Norton. Brett, we have such a fun day planned, don't we? Yeah, man, we certainly do. I'm really looking forward to this one. It's uh, been a long time in coming to get a full uh, conference focused on scopes, and so I'm really excited for this one. Uh, the Beyond Clean team is bringing our audience yet another industry first because it wouldn't be a Beyond Clean event if we didn't shake things up a bit. The title of today's conference is Flex, exploring the in intersection of quality, education, and equipment. We have such a great lineup of industry experts joining us for a full day of insightful presentations and candid conversations on the industry's most controversial and topic, flexible endoscopes. I would like to extend a huge thank you to our event sponsor, Agility and Northfield Medical for helping to make this exciting day of virtual learning possible. For those of you anxiously awaiting your CE credits after viewing all of today's sessions, you'll have access to the full conference survey and be able to download your CE certificate. We are excited you've chosen to kick off your weekend by joining us for this one of a kind event dedicated to endoscope education and best practices. I understand you probably have a lot going on between work and home, so I just wanna say thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being dedicated to education and for doing something that will help you grow as a sterile processing professional. So sit back, relax, and if you're at work, start that sterilizer load. It's time to get this event started. Our first speaker is Melissa Kubach, Clinical Education and Training Manager at Agility. She has spent the last 19 years of her career as a flexible endoscope educator, and she has extensive background in endoscope training and field support. Melissa is considered a subject matter expert and is a highly sought out endoscope educator. Melissa is also a product inventor for infection control devices related to endoscope reprocessing and has been awarded multiple patents. Today, Melissa will discuss the most common mistake technicians are making during each phase of the endoscope cleaning cycle, she will also offer corrective actions to ensure these mistakes are no longer repeated. So why is effective cleaning so difficult to achieve? Melissa is here to help answer this industry burning question. So without further ado, kicking off Flex, the Flexible Scope Conference, is Melissa Kubach. Welcome to Flexible Scope Reprocessing in a Time of High Anxiety understanding core reprocessing steps, and learning from common mistakes. Today's course objectives are to recognize current events causing increased anxiety during flexible endoscope reprocessing, discuss basic required steps for ineffective reprocessing, and identify common mistakes made during flexible endoscope reprocessing. So let's touch on a few current events raising reprocessing anxiety. 
Outbreaks related to dewanoscopes were in the news and at the top of everyone's worry list from 2013 to 2018. Infections related to CRE, carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriaceae, which is an antibiotic-resistant superbug, firmly placed the endoscope on the top 10 annual ECRI patient safety concern list until outbreaks subsided. There were multiple factors contributing to these outbreaks, which really made it a perfect storm scenario. The latest infection spotlight has fallen on flexible endoscopes used for urological applications. Cystoscopes and ureteroscopes have been found to have caused infection from missed leaks and contaminated accessories, and we'll touch on this a little more further down the line. So why is this type of scope so hard to clean? When you look back in time, while ERCP was near hysteria levels, it now all seems so clear and logical that trouble with these models was a ticking time bomb. Everyone has had follow your manufacturer's IFU drilled into your head to the point of pain, yet it still amazes me how many times I encounter staff that have not read or ever reviewed their IFU. The ERCP moment in time was different in a very important way. The IFU instructions, brushes, and cleaning procedure were not sufficient, and this was not limited to just one manufacturer. What do you do when your IFU is wrong? This is what you're supposed to go by. On top of this, there was also a design flaw within one of the leading models that accounted for the majority of these infections. Add in the complexity with cleaning the elevator, a few patients with resistant strains of CRE, and pow, you have a perfect storm. So what does this mean to you if you do not reprocess this type of scope? It means the bar has been raised for reprocessing flexible endoscopes irregardless of type, model, or manufacturer. Your process and associated documentation are likely to draw greater scrutiny from external surveyors and from internal infection preventionists. You are now expected to be perfect, even when flexible endoscopes are a small portion of what you do during your shift. It really takes everybody associated from procedure to storage to achieve successful results. This includes how cases are scheduled, how POU cleaning and teardown is performed, safe and timely transportation, and even adequacy of inventory comes into play. You need sufficient time, tools, training, and managerial support to be successful. There were numerous notifications specific to reprocessing duodenoscopes through this time, and many facilities still run their HLD process twice. A select few who still have access to EO sterilization have incorporated that. Culturing per the CDC's interim surveillance instruction is still recommended and post-market surveillance study is ongoing, although right now the results have not been terribly encouraging regarding contamination rates. Many of the facilities are conducting ATP test swabs specific to the elevator area, and the FDA has acknowledged that detection of adenosine triphosphate may be an effective method for measuring reprocessing effectiveness. All manufacturers are transitioning to disposable aspects for duodenoscopes. And additionally, water-soluble substances such as, as simethicone have been minimized, but it's still injected through the working channel via lavage at the majority of the facilities I visit. I like to joke that if you were to read the fine print on the warning label on the back of the simethicone bottle, it would say removal of this product from your department may induce fits or acts of aggression because I have seen it. The key takeaway here is that every facility should have a quality assurance program that's uh, specific to flexible endoscopes or be on a path to a quality assurance reprocessing program. It is really important to understand the required reprocessing steps and what each action achieves. To keep things a bit more interesting, I find the common mistakes for each phase of reprocessing is a better learning tool than just talking in generalities about each individual step. There would also not be enough time or patience for me to cover every single step for every single model and manufacturer. 
Each section will post a slide of the core steps that we'll touch on, but we will really contrast these by concentrating on some of the most egregious errors. Endoscope reprocessing and handling is tenuous at best, and I equate it to plate spinning. So I call it scope du soleil, and I had to look long and hard. I was having troubles finding something uh, to make this image. And so I'll apologize right now that I had to use a picture of myself. We're on to pre-cleaning, AKA bedside cleaning. Proper steps, preparation of detergent and water solution, wiping down of the insertion tube, suctioning solution and air, blowing out of air, water channels, addressing auxiliary or specialty channels. Common errors. The very first one on the list, of course, is no bedside cleaning. And I'm sure for anyone in GI right now, you're probably looking at each other going, what? GI really does have a good handle on bedside cleaning overall. Um, the only area I see is the skipping of the some of the steps related to the specialty models, like the balloon channels, the elevator flushing channels, and some of the multi-stage suctioning steps that are required at the end of the case for the linears and radials. So otherwise, GI is very good, but no bedside cleaning is really in here for the ORs. I find that I get about 30% compliance across the United States. And I have a lot of people say to me, this is just going to go to be cleaned. And I don't know why I have to do this. And what they fail to realize is that this is the first reduction in bile burden. And this is the first reduction of logs with, associated with this bile burden. And if this is not done correctly or in a timely manner, the subsequent technician who has to clean this scope is possibly not going to be able to get anything in or out of those channels. Um, it may be humanly impossible to remove at some point. And for patient safety, this is one of the most important steps. Also, I remind people to watch how uh, they handle their tower to when they are doing bedside clean or um, they're moving things around, make sure that you're not touching all over your tower or the reusable items that you use, such as pigtails for particular models or the 24 hour flushing irrigation tubing. Um, you are going to wipe it all down. I understand that, but you cannot tell every spot you've touched with your contaminated hands. And it's very easy to miss something. And these items are going to be reused for the next patients. At this point, I always um, remind people that they really need to use full PPE when they're doing bedside clean. I find a lot of GI departments where um, people are just not following uh, protection for their face and mouth. And um, also, I've seen a lot of use of utility gloves. And you need to be using extended gloves that are well up over, extended over your cup, up your arm while you're doing bedside cleaning. I've seen plenty of people dinged under survey for that. Also, very few people when it pertains to OR use are keeping the initia uh, initiation of the bedside clean time recorded. A lot of uh, departments just simply write it and note it on the MRN sticker. But I have a lot of um, departments that when they do receive their scopes, they have no idea when or how it was handled. Leak testing. Um, leakage testing is the one thing that everyone can do to help protect the patient, help protect their equipment, not only from damage and repair costs, but also, also downtime. Proper leak testing includes removing all accessories prior to the test, attaching the waterproof cap, confirming you do have air function, that your leak tester is functioning, making sure that your scope is holding insufflation, for safety before it goes into the fluid and submerging it in water alone, observing the scope, angulating in all directions, depressing and manipulating the video buttons, removing it from the water, then releasing the air, then disconnecting. And if it is leaking, maintaining the air pressure through the entire cleaning process. 
Common leak test errors. Um, I see a lot of people who turn that air on after they have already placed the scope in water. And this really negates the point of doing leak tests because we are trying to protect it from fluid invasion and we want to know if it's leaking because it is an infection risk to the patient. Um, I see a lot of endoscopes that are not entirely covered through our entire cleaning process. And this mostly, I find, has to do with leaky drains and sinks that are too large or the fill time is too slow. So when you do not cover that scope, it can leak from anywhere. You may be missing a leak. Also, when you are doing your leak test, this is when you need to make sure that the knobs um, and the variable stiffness adjuster knobs are in the correct position. You should never reprocess a scope with lock knobs, and the um, stiffening adjuster knob should be in the neutral position for your entire cleaning process. I have seen a number of people release the air while still in the water, which can lead to fluid invasions in a scope that does not have a hole in it. And there are little O-rings in the connector from the leak tester that hooks onto the venting port. And while these may get worn over time, they may still be good and leak free. But once you release that and that pressure moves away, it can pull water right into your EL area where your electronics are and lead to fluid invasion with no leak in your scope. I also see, especially with one of the more current models that is now um, has a self-venting valve and it does not have a waterproof cap, um, failing to release all of the air pressure by allowing it to have enough time to release can cause fluid invasion problems. It may only open that valve, that self-ending valve, for a split second, but it can take just a little bit of moisture in over and over until it has caused a great amount of damage. It may take a while to show, but it will come around. So always make sure that you have allowed that time to release that air out of that scope so that it's equal ambient from the outside air pressure to the inside. Fluid invasion from the leak tester is a horrific event. Uh, when it goes on. I had a hospital I went to often and I was called in because they couldn't get any images in the GI. You could see water in the eye pieces at, um, within the urology clinic and the OR had to cancel cases. Every single department was affected. Um, and what it turned out to be when I came in is I immediately saw the leak tester tubing hanging in the water when I walked into the department and there had been a new trainee and her trainer had accidentally let that fall in during training and didn't point out that this was not supposed to be this way when she pulled it out. And so the person being trained thought she was supposed to leave that hanging in the water. She managed to do $54,000 worth of damage in three weeks and she almost had a breakdown. Luckily, she stuck with it, and now she's a supervisor, and she's one of the best technicians I have the pleasure of knowing. So you can get past a disaster, but just a simple little thing like that, one person not really explaining something during training, that's all it takes to have Armageddon ensue. Manual cleaning process. Um, of course, we want to add detergent to the sink. We want to submerge the scope. We want to scrub and brush the entire external surface. We want to brush all biopsy, suction channels, and valve ports. We want to complete specialty brushing steps, suction and flush detergent into all channels, allow for minimum contact soak time, and remove detergent from the endoscope and internal channels with air. There are a lot of things that can go wrong during manual cleaning, but most of these have greatly improved with automated flushing devices and sink dosing units um, that are checked on a regular basis. Those, those items alone have corrected a lot of the inefficiencies that, that were correctable. Um, I still see the number one missing step is the suction step with the suction adapter for one of the leading models. And this has been 
the the most popular step to skip for many many years but i do see this improving with some of the new automated flushing units that it includes that step you don't need the suction adapter anymore which makes it a lot more appealing because you don't have to have another item to either high level disinfect manually or sterilize and this is really um, getting this step put back into the process because you cannot skip it underneath the programming. So that is really good. Another thing I want to say, though, for the departments, usually sterile processing, um, that may use a syringe for manual flushing, a uh, syringe size does matter. And I find a lot of extremely small syringes out there that should be 30 cc or 60 cc. And this is mostly, I find it with urology models because they don't need a flushing tubing and they have a lure adaption to the port. But though those syringe sizes mean something and that's how the cleaning was validated. You may not get enough pressure uh, to do any good flushing or cleaning or rinsing with a syringe that's the wrong size. And I do understand it is a lot easier on your wrist. So if you can use an automated flushing device, that would be a wonderful thing. Also, a lot of people do not understand where that dedicated soak time comes in. So it does not actually start when you put the endoscope into the detergent or enzymatic detergent. When it starts is after you have done all of the scrubbing, all of the brushing, all of the suctioning and all of the flushing and the channels are sated. That is when the minimum contact soak time for the chemical manufacturer starts. And I invariably have somebody say, but it's been in there all this time and I understand that. But you really want the surfactants or the enzymes working on the trace elements, not the big elements, because those trace elements, there's always going to be some trace in these scopes at that point. And you want it working on the things that you are not humanly capable of getting out no matter how many times you clean it. So that's really where it starts. And of course, it makes me very unpopular because it always adds a, a hard time onto the cleaning, uh, the cleaning time overall. So I apologize, but that is where it belongs. Rinse after cleaning, submerge the endoscope in clean water, attach flushing tubing and adapters, flush all channels with clean rinse water, confirm flushing requirements, purge all the channels with air, and remove it from the water. Common mistakes for rinse after cleaning. Failure to disinfect, disinfect the sinks per the endoscope's IFU. Um, this is mostly related to one manufacturer. I know that we need to disinfect our sinks after we go through a whole run, but one of the manufacturers has it happening multiple times within the same cleaning event. And it is very difficult, especially if you have a slow sink fill, to do that. And so I find people skipping that often. I also find, uh, once again, failure to completely cover the whole endoscope. It has a theme. This is a theme. And of course, visual inspection that everyone knows is required under magnification at the end of the manual cleaning process before the endoscope moves on to high-level disinfection or sterilization. But I see it all the time, especially once it, the schedule gets busy, the scopes are flying through, and I see no one checking the, the overall condition and especially the distal end under magnification. This is meant to protect the patient from maybe a sharp portion that is not visible to the naked eye or something that might be loose and is made to help the cleaning technician find residual debris or something that made pocket debris that would also cause an infection risk for the patient. High level disinfection, we want to confirm chemical is at the correct temperature, confirm chemical um, MEC or MRC, whichever way you call it, is, is you know, being done. And submerge endoscope in the chemical, fill each channel with chemical until all air is removed. Use a timer to confirm correct soaking time per the manufacturer's IFU. Remove all flushing tubing and adapters for chemical contact. Purge all channels with air prior to removing from chemical. Common HLD errors 
um, I think the number one thing that is the advanced cleaning claims and the lack of understanding for a lot of the departments that take their advanced cleaning claims. So these claims per the AER manufacturer allow you to skip certain manual cleaning steps. But a lot of people don't realize how contingent being able to use these claims is on how good, first of all, your bedside cleaning process is. You have to have a full bedside proper cleaning process or you cannot use the advanced claim and skip the steps. So once again, not picking on the OR, where there is not a lot of compliance or at least not full compliance in this area of bedside cleaning, a lot of times these scopes are being put through and they have not had that full cleaning. So I just tell everyone to be cautious with this. Also, a lot of this and how you handle it has to do with your affiliations from your professional best practice organizations and your the standards that you cite. Many of them do not support the skipping of any manual cleaning steps, no matter what your advanced claims are. This is also not supported by the FDA or CDC. And the, even one of the manufacturers that made the claims discourages someone from using them. So I always say really, really understand that and double check your cleaning policy. I often find when I'm auditing that the policy says every step will be performed for the manufacturer's IFU. And if this isn't in the manufacturer's IFU, then you may be out of compliance with your own policy. Plus, there's also some advanced um, cleaning claim units that will not allow you to reprocess um, under advanced claims with an, an exposed elevator wire. So always make sure that you really understand those claims have something in writing on those claims and that it matches all of your other process, including your affiliations for standards and organizational bodies. Um, I do not have a ton of problem, pardon me, with MRC uh, method or frequency. It's really with methods. So I do find a lot of people doing testing that do not understand what their dwell time is and what their read time is. I would say I find it about a third of the time. It is quickly disappearing as I also see people get dinged under um, survey with this. And But I always remind everyone to understand this um, that this is procedurally done correctly. Contamination of the soaking tray lid or the AER exterior. Um, luckily, there is not a whole lot of manual disinfection going on for flexible endoscopes anymore, and I know that this is going to be completely um, discouraged once again in the new ST91 uh, that's due out this fall. But I still see occasionally someone soaking or someone going into one of their older AERs that doesn't have a touchless system, and they will load their endoscope in, they are contaminated, and then they will pull down their lid, they will touch on their keypads, or they will put the soaking tray lid back on, and some may wipe and some may not. So the next person who comes in to potentially take that um, endoscope out and touches those same areas and then picks up the scope is going to recontaminate their scope. So I always tell everyone to pay attention to that. Also, uh, correct rinse water exchanges if you are doing manual cleaning. When I see someone doing manual cleaning, I usually always stay and wait and to watch them reprocess a scope. Because while it all sounds good, when it comes down to how they rinse, sometimes they're going back into sinks that are not clean. Sometimes they are carrying and dumping water for their water exchanges and some just aren't doing the full water exchanges per their chemical. So always make sure you are able to fulfill the full rinsing uh, requirements of those endoscopes and they need to be completely um, immer uh, immersed in the water again. They cannot be sticking up and out. Sterilization. We want to confirm all model compatibility and recommended cycles. Sterilization with venting valves uh, installed, of course, for applicable models. 
And also some of the liquid chemical sterilization has to be treated as if it were high level disinfected when it comes to storage, since current methods do not allow for maintaining of endoscope sterility upon opening the AER lid for the tabletop models that um, are unable to con you know, contain the item. Common sterilization errors. Uh, number one is handling of endoscopes as clean as if they are clean in um, SPD after manual cleaning. So I understand that once it goes through that pass through, you have to assume it's clean. But a lot of these endoscopes, I mean, they're, they're not high level disinfected. They've only achieved manual cleaning. So we haven't destroyed any um, spores or um, deactivated any spores. And I always warn everyone, hey, when you're taking this over to your clean area and when you're handling this, realize that this is not a clean item. And additionally, kind of counteracting this and creating a greater issue, um, I have found multiple departments that are using low-level quats, which are ammonium-based, to wipe down their endoscopes prior to passing them through to the clean side. And those low-level quats are really made for hard uh, surface disinfection, not for flexible endoscopes, which are really rather porous. And they, we have no idea what it really does to the materials and their longevity, but there is also no way to tell since those chemicals are not validated to know how much residual chemical may be going on that scope to the patient in the procedure. We don't know what those residuals are and what that could cause. Plus, we have no idea what the reaction is between that chemical and the sterilization um, chemical. So please make sure you are not using unapproved chemicals, at, but do address how you handle that scope as it moves to the clean side. And I will mention, of course, we do need to install the venting cap. I'm assuming everybody at this moment in time has blown the end off of a scope or seen what it looks like. It's not pretty. Uh, thank goodness it's usually a bending rubber, but it could also destroy something in the distal end. So um, always important to think of. And um, once again, sterilizing endoscope models and methods that are not approved. I don't see this that often, but I do occasionally run into a really old scope in a facility where all of their models are um, approved for peroxide vapor or gas plasma. And that model isn't, and it manages to make its way in there, but it usually doesn't last very long. Uh, it doesn't last a lot of procedures, <laughs> but it is not, you know, you always have to make sure you know that that endoscope is approved for that sterilization method. Drying, uh, purge all your channels with air to remove water. Flush all channels with 70% isopropyl alcohol until exiting the channel. Purge all the channels with air and dry the endoscope. The big one really is on the top and the bottom. Not dry, not dry, not dry. Uh, insufficient purging and drying of channels is the number one problem for the drying of endoscopes. It's easy to wipe down the outside, but it's very difficult to dry the internal channels, especially the very tiny internal channels. And I don't think that it initially anyone realized how long it took for those channels to dry. And this could encourage bacterial growth. So it will also be addressed in the new ST7, uh, ST91 coming out in the fall. And they are going to um, really recommend automated drying and extended drying. And everyone should be aware that drying scoring is on the Joint Commission um, checklist. So it's not going to be ignored for long if you're ignoring it now. Storage, we want our endoscopes when they do have to hang um, horizontally. We want them to hang freely without touching the bottom, each other, preferably everything. Someday I think endoscopes are going to have to levitate themselves in the cabinet. Uh, we also want storage that promotes drying or maintains drying. 
and expiration uh, policies and procedures always need to be followed. And I think that there are a number of um, guidelines that are pretty much on the same page for that uh, expiration time, but there is some leeway uh, if you do have great drying and great storage that could alleviate some of your expiration uh, woes. So common storage errors. Number one, I still see a lot of storage areas that are just not clean. They may clean them on a regular basis, but they're not cleaning them often enough. And I always recommend when everybody looks into that cabinet to store something, check the what that cabinet looks like. Um, also, I am still finding towels or chucks in the bottom of the cabinet. And those really can, when they get wet, encourage growth, which jeopardizes the cleanliness of all of the rest of the endoscopes in that cabinet. So that could, could make the rest of those endoscopes considered not clean, and you may need to reprocess all of them if you put those towels and chucks in there or have evidence of fluid in the cabinet. Reprocessing is not just about the scope anymore. We can't forget all the other things like transport. I would like to touch on what I call foam abuse. And there are foams made that have been studied that have uh, a certain level of stasis that if you know uh, cleaning is, going, is inevitably going to be delayed, you can use this foam to help keep the scope in, a, in good shape and moist and um, until it can be cleaned for an extensive length of time per the manufacturer. I know delayed cleaning of all sort is discouraged no matter what you're using, but I've seen a lot of facilities that are starting to use this as a part of their process, not as an inevitable consequence that they are trying to avoid. And that is worrisome because I think that is not going to be good overall in the long run. Um, but um, it really should be used under extenuating circumstances. And I also just want to say again, transport, uh, the three C's. So covered, contained, and not carried. I have found multiple departments carrying their clean scopes to their procedure room down a common patient hallway, more so than ever this last year. So I, it's like come back up. It, it went away for a while, but now it's come back up. And uh, so I wanted to mention it because you really need to make sure you protect that scope from recontamination. And no one should be carrying scopes these days. I mean, they're too expensive and too easy to drop. They're like handling octopuses. And you need to make sure that they are contained and safe. Scope accessories. I know I mentioned early on that we were going to talk about reusable accessories, specifically the irrigation adapters for those urology scopes. And I'm sure that everyone has seen or used irrigation adapters that cleans urology scopes. And some of these come apart into multiple pieces, like four pieces, and they're hard to take apart. They're hard to clean. There's There are lumens within them. And I have recently found places where these were not being taken apart, but I had infection prevention with me. So, um, you know, that was all going to get straightened out. We made sure everything was pulled. We made sure everything was re-clean. It was um, sterilized and, um, you know, that they were going to look back to see um, when's the last time it had been taken apart. And I think it was just one staff member that uh, really didn't understand that those actually come apart. <laughs> So this is where we're seeing some of those uh, infection outbreaks come from. And they found that it had the same bacteria within the irrigation adapters as it did within the, you know, the patient. So that is where they ca it came from. Also, I remind everybody, and I've been kind of banging the drum for the last year and a half, dilators with lumens are the new scope. We'll see more of this once again with the new uh, standard coming out, but dilators are going to more closely be associated with what you do for flexible endoscopes, such as traceability, um, 
the way they're stored, the way they're dried. Um, these are going to come up fast and furious and um, once the standards were released, and I'm sure we'll see a lot more, um, you know, a lot more documentation added on to dilators, which most people did not even keep track of esophageal dilators to that degree because some of them or certain types of them do not have unique identifiers or serial numbers on them. So it'll be interesting to see how that's handled. Um, and uh, I do still occasionally find dilators in hideous storage conditions. I've never had an accessory that has had more storage issues. Um, I do still find them inside their original cases, airtight, still wet, and even the original packing foam still in the case. So I uh, might want to check on that. Also, uh, it's better now, but about a fourth of the time, I will find a dilator that is out of, um, that like a set that's actually expired. So um, it's always worth looking at all of them. So look at your Maloney's, your Bougie's, your Savory's, whatever you have, and just make sure none of them are expired because it's a real easy thing to miss. And last on this list is brushes in poor condition. Most everybody is using reusable, I mean, I'm sorry, is using disposable brushes, not reusable. But I still occasionally find um, some reusable brushes in sterile processing. And more importantly, I find specialty brushes that are autoclavable within GI. And lately I have been finding a lot of specialty brushes for one of the particular uh, manufacturers curvy linear elevators. And I literally found one two weeks ago that the bristles were half, I mean, were about half the length they should have been. And almost all the bristles were broken off. And I go, where, where do you think that's going? Where do you think that's going to end up? And it's going to be in a patient. It's going to be in your scope. So um, if you are uh, using those types of brushes, please uh, make sure that you're really checking condition. And the ones I found were even discolored, even if they were cleaned, I, it, it was a bad find. So please pay attention to reusable items and make sure they are um, safe for reprocessing your scopes. Documentation, um, don't panic. I'm not gonna go through all this. Um, I really, uh, this isn't even all of it, but I wanted to keep it as a full slide so people would remember there's a big wait for documentation and please do document everything you possibly can to help support your quality system. But the one thing I want to point out, especially as it pertains to um, sterilization, I still see a lot of trouble tying the patient to the serial number to the sterilization load. First of all, a lot of times those patient stickers are just not coming down and it's difficult for someone to go retrieve that when they are probably shorthanded and um, have more than they can possibly do. They don't have time to chase that down. But there's also a different mentality between sterilization and high level disinfection. When you're sterilizing, it is usually about how those instruments were sterilized prior to use in the OR. But when you're talking about high-level disinfection and flexible endoscopes, it's really about that patient's bio burden within that scope and the cleaning run after that, um, the cleaning load run after that. So it's a whole different mentality on how you look at that scope and that documentation. So that is really what I wanted to highlight here. Um, I also wanted to mention just because this story is very true and drives this home uh, in, in a way I couldn't make up. Um, a good long time ago, there was a gentleman who presented through the ER at one of my um, well-known hospitals, and he was very, very sick, and they decided they needed to bronch him bedside, which they did, and uh, two and a half days later, he came back prions positive, he actually had mad cow's disease. And um, basically with these items, you cannot do anything but destroy them. You cannot reuse them, you cannot save them, and at least in this country, you cannot clean them. So 
since they did not keep track of their serial number, they had to incinerate all of their bronchoscopes, even the models that they knew there was no way they could have, would have ever used on him. It didn't matter. They had to, because that endoscope went back into the cabinet, everything it touched, they lost the reprocessing unit. They lost everything in that department, and it was devastating. And they borrowed from everywhere, and it took them a year to get back up to the full inventory and purchase in and get in their new items. But they also had to letter everyone over that two and a half days that might have been exposed to prions that actually had a bronchoscope used on them. So this, like I said, this is a long time ago, but it always drives home how, how, and I mean, beyond just patient traceability, just how much trouble you can be in if you do not keep track of serial numbers faithfully and tie them to your loads. Competency, I always say it's really hard to, to prove you're competent, um, but a lot, uh, strong competencies go a long way towards doing that. So not only return demonstrations, but competencies with model specific information in them. So not the generalities like, oh, flushes the channel sufficiently. It, I'm saying very much specifics. It could be in cleaning types. So like your gastroscope and colonoscope that aren't special, do they may be cleaned the exact same way. You could keep those in the same competency. But if you have a different manufacturer, that's a separate competency. ERCP, a separate competency. EUS, a separate competency. Every single one of these should have unique um, information to those models uh, so that they really do show a strong, um, a strong competency and people really do have to demonstrate those steps correctly. Also, when to renew, um, most people renew annually per, it depends a lot on who is your recommending body once again and who you are following. Um, but of course you need upon hire with your initial training, there needs to be a competency. Anytime there is a new model of endoscope introduced or even any type of ancillary equipment, like a new flushing unit or a new AER, then retraining and competency has to be done. Um, also, like I said, annually or on a continuing basis per your um, affiliated recommendation organization. IFU access, I know um, I've mentioned a lot of people haven't read them, even if they have them. But every time someone tells me they have one source, I ask, and I'm not talking about sterile processing here, I'm mostly talking in the GI, I ask them to show me the mo this model, um, one of the models they have. I say, please go pull it up for me. And about a third of the time, they don't know their password, or they have never had a password, or there's a limited number of users, and they don't know who to get a hold of. So they say they have it, and they do, but they really need to know how to get in and out of it as well. Um, so I always mention that, and it's, it's very easy to trip people up that way during audit. The environment, um, of course, everybody's clean to dirty is getting better. Most people have rebuilt or expanded or built on new areas, but um, I still see a lot of open doors. So I put shut the door on here, shut the door or you cannot get your air exchanges, and that's going to make all of those other pressure, ventilation, temperature, and humidity parameters off balance. But I do find that more and more that is electronically monitored um, by maintenance or, or building services, and so that has improved as well to some degree. Uh, a lot of people ask me about water quality, and overall, potable water is fine for all of your manual cleaning um, you may have certain models that recommend a different quality of water. Uh, sterile is usually very hard to work with if you're doing anything manually, and most of your water quality is going to come from your reprocessing units. But if you do um, need a higher quality of water, I mean, the sterile processing departments at this point seem to have plenty of access to uh, RO or DI and uh, critical, those critical waters are a, a lot more available and a lot more systems are built in than it used to be. So that's not so much a problem. 
but if you have ever had a water quality integrity issue, uh, then there should have been a corrective action and there should be continuous monitoring and that should be able to be produced so that you can continue testing to make sure that whatever bug you had or whatever was going on with your water is gone and stays gone. And usually I see things pop up sometimes seasonally or I'll see something pop up because someone's working on the main down the street or there's construction within the hospital itself. And um, so those are always things that you want to immediately investigate because it can cause you a lot of issues in so many ways beyond flexible endoscopes, um, even with your steam. So um, that's usually my answer. Uh, last but most important, of course, is the patient. Um, with all of this negative press, so many people have heard about scopes, and at one point I even saw an article that t the title said, The Killer Scope. And there was so much news coverage, even through the government and everything else, that there are a lot of patients that are now not so sure about flexible scopes. And they really don't know the difference from one scope to the next. And they could be coming in for, you know, just for a colonoscopy, and they're going to be worried that they're going to get that killer scope. So always, you know, be aware that these patients may have more anxiety towards this procedure now, too. And um, you you just never know what they're thinking. I just tell everybody, you never know what the patient's thinking and um, have a good answer for them and, and make sure that they're not concerned. So before we finish up, I wanted to show just a few photos and with a few closing comments because they're kind of like a, watching a train wreck in progress. So this is a dinoscope that was on the wall waiting for the next use. And someone happened to mention to me on a phone call that the physician had complained that he was hanging his stents up. And so he had torn a couple stents during his procedures. And, um, but she wasn't aware how long that had gone on. So I said, you know what, don't use it. I'm gonna come over and take a look at it. So I went in and when I looked at the scope, you could not see any debris in the scope when I looked at it just with my eye. But once I got into it and started cleaning, I broke a stone out, out of that. And you can see the file and everything from that stone that didn't even, wasn't even a big stone. Like you can't even see the little particles of it down in the water heart. I mean, from this picture at all. But boy, it was in there and it wasn't allowing that elevator to completely, you know, all go all the way down. It wasn't allowing it to completely um, go flush with the back. So that's why he was catching his stents and had that problem. And of course, I ultimately had to go to infection control after this just to have them investigate when he had made the initial complaint and when he tore the initial stent. Since this was on the wall and they were going to use it, I don't know if it got used. So infection control took it over from there. I helped them finish, I cleaned, finished cleaning the scope, and then they went on, re-cleaned it, redid everything they were supposed to do, and the elevator worked fine um, visually, but it was being held for, you know, and quarantined so that it could be cultured, and um, they were going to take a lot of extra precaution with the scope after that, and rightfully so. I know this is blurry, and I apologize for being blurry on the end there. Um, basically, this scope, they claimed had a bedside clean, a full bedside clean. And in their mind, I think they really did do a full bedside clean. But everyone concentrates so much on wiping down the insertion tube that it often, no one really wipes off the front of the seat cover on the distal end. So I always remind everyone to make sure that they are thoroughly not just wiping the insertion tube, but wiping the front and the lenses. And there are times where blood or uh, debris can actually get baked on those light guide lenses, um, especially if it's a long procedure and um, and you're using a, like a xenon light source, it could get hot. And so you really want to pay attention to those when you're cleaning not just that they're not chipped, but really look for any kind of residual that's stuck or baked on there that might be very difficult to get off 
Um, and you may have to use a, like an alcohol prep pad or something, which you really don't want to use before you clean it. But if there's no other way to get it off, then put it through its whole procedure again after that. This is just a leak, just an example of a leak, nothing special. But I put it up so you can see how easy it is to see that bubble and that leak. Because then I put up this picture and I say, okay, where is the leak on this scope? So it might be hard for you to find. And if we were all together, we could have fun with this, but I'm just going to give it away. Uh, most of the people say those little bubbles that are around the control body and the lever, like a, that's called an S cover on that side, and, and there are little bubbles around there. But that's not it. That is actually not leaking. Those are Klingons. Those aren't actually a leak. Those are ones you can wipe away and they don't come back. But if you look at that light guide prong, you will see right on the edge of that light guide prong, there's almost what looks like a little string hanging out of it. And that's a little bitty string of like champagne-like bubbles that are coming out of that light guide. Um, this endoscope had been bonked on a counter and that light guide hit a counter and that's all it showed. And needless to say, nobody was finding that leak <laughs> in the facility. So, uh, it's a real difficult one, but I think it's a, it's a good example of a really difficult to find leak that you can actually still see and understand. I like to call this slide scope ball. One of the departments that I have worked with a lot, their physician, their first physician and main physician starts at 5 a.m. So they are usually done around one in the afternoon and I happen to be over in the OR um that day and it was just a few minutes after one so i walked over to the department just to say hi and see what was going on and they had started to let their cleaning crew clean their storage cabinets so that it would faithfully be done every day and what they didn't realize is that this is what the cleaning crew was doing with their clean scopes when um they were taking them down out of the storage cabinet to clean it and of course they were not necessarily they were using gloves but i can't tell you that they weren't cleaning and still touching things with those gloves um, when i showed the supervisor this in the department the next day she almost hyperventilated <laughs> but we did uh, catch it and it was caught very quickly and um, luckily it was stopped i'm sure this is not good for the equipment to be piled all on top of each other either this is the perfect example of not caring about how you ship and what you ship with what. Um, this was, uh, you know, you can see there are flexible scopes in this. You can see there's heavy power equipment. There were even a couple sharps in one of those bags um, that you can't see. And so I always warn everybody to really double check who is shipping your stuff and what they're shipping it in. Um, unless you have a very established shipping procedure and how things are going to be packaged, um, I always double check. And if someone's new to the shipping department or you hand this off to someone else to ship that's new, definitely go through how to properly pack these items and what shouldn't be shipped with other things, especially your very delicate, flexible endoscopes. And one of these scopes only had a tiny pinhole in the bending rubber, um, but it could have been completely destroyed and needed to be completely rebuilt from this shipping disaster. This is an example of a smashed like I tube. Um, if you have any tabletop units that have a tray that you have to install the scope in, always make sure that the scope is all the way in the tray and not up over the edge before you shut the lid. And I have honestly seen people slam this lid like it's a stuffed trunk and they have to force it in there. And I've seen them just completely slam it down on the scopes. So um, always make sure you double check uh, that everything's installed in the tray the way it's supposed to be. This is an example of fluid invasion. And that doesn't, I mean, that may look like that fluid invasion has been there in that EL for years, but that is fluid invasion from just three or four days and the corrosion and the, the disaster it causes within the electronics. 
Now, all of this has to be taken apart piece by piece. Everything has to be completely clean. The electronics that are bad or the wiring has to be replaced, and or maybe the board has to be replaced. And all of the inside of the body is just as bad as this. And this is all dropping out of that, um, that EL connector. So I really warn everyone to be very cautious if they suspect they have any fluid invasion. Maybe they're having some image flickering or slow initiation or something that might lead you to believe that some moisture is on the pins or in the EL. Um, always remove a scope if you have any suspicion, even if it's making it through its cases, because you don't know. It's going to go out, I'm sure, when you're almost done with the case or when it's a critical moment or you're going to lose a biopsy or something along that line. So always um, remove an item that you have any sense is not right um, before you have a problem. Better to have it out and find out it's okay than the other way around. So that does it for me today, and I just want to say thank you to everyone so much uh, for allowing me to speak today, and I look forward to hopefully meeting everyone in person at the worst by next year. So have a great day. Well, thank you, Melissa, for your insightful presentation on such an important topic. Uh, thank you, everyone out there, for your incredible engagement so early in the morning. We have so many great questions come in that, unfortunately, we just do not have time for. So we will make sure that Melissa will see your questions. And you can also send Melissa an email from her contact information on the screen. I know she would be happy to answer them. Uh, so after this session, you will automatically transition you to the next session. But as a reminder, there is a 15 minute break between each session throughout the conference today. If the registration page appears and you've already registered, just click the already registered link and enter your email to enter the event. You will be able to access the CE survey and certificate by visiting beyondclean.net slash virtual events and will be automatically transferred to that survey page at the end of today's conference. All sessions will be available to you on demand to share and view after today's live event. We're so glad you're here and we'll see you back here in about 15 minutes. See you soon.